Turn in your Bibles to the book of Titus. The book of Titus. That's where our lesson will be from. I want us to be familiar with this book as we go through and see exactly what it is God wants us to know tonight. My title for the book, when I outline it, and the title also for the sermon is Setting Things in Order. And I get that from Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Now, as you run through your Bibles, and especially as you run through your New Testaments, you'll see almost half of the New Testament is written by Paul. A third of the New Testament are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And also, the second longest of all the books comes right after that. That's the narrative of the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, Luke and Acts, when you put them together, are almost half of the New Testament. Luke was a doctor, and I bet he was a preacher, because he talked more than anyone else. Then you get to what we call the Pauline epistles. And it starts with the book of Romans, and goes all the way down to the book of Philemon. It starts with the longest book, which is Romans, second longest book, which is 1 Corinthians. And as you go along... It's not always this way, but usually is from the longest to the shortest is the order that they're found in. Then you come to what we call the general epistles or the letters not written by Paul. I think the first one of those is the book of Hebrews. Now, some of your Bibles will say the epistle of Hebrews written by Paul. But it looks like as you look at the text of the book, it's written by somebody else. Who wrote it, though? We don't know. But it's the longest of the general epistles, and it goes, the order of the New Testament goes from the longest all the way down to the shortest. And so we finish with you. And then God decided to put an exclamation point on his New Testament. And so he gives, gives us the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, the vision of the end. There are many different interpretations of the book, but the point of the book is we're going to win. God is God, and He will destroy anything that stands in His place. And those who are faithful to God will be taken care of, will be cared for, and will reign for Him forevermore in heaven. And so as you look at our testaments, then we narrow, narrow down, and we see different versions or different portions of the Paul letters. And you see the prison epistles. You see the uh, Corinthian and the Roman letters, which really lay out a lot of things about church. And we see what some people call the pastoral epistles. And that is letters which teach us how to, to put it in a simple way, simple way, how to do church. You read in 1 Timothy and you read in 2 Timothy, you see how to do church from the idea or from the perspective of a preacher. When you read Titus, you see a little bit different perspective. Now, Titus was a preacher, but you see it just overall, how to make the church work. What a successful congregation of the Lord's church will look like. I love how these books are put together. And you'll read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 22, where Paul says, The things, Timothy, I have taught you, you also teach to good, faithful men, that they might be able to teach people as well. Titus was a younger preacher than Paul, as was Timothy. And Titus was being sent to a, a very interesting, if you will, congregation. Because you read in chapter 1 that the city or the island of Crete is full of evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and liars. Now, if you're finding a place where you want to go to church, I'm not sure that's your first choice. But that's where Titus was going. And so Titus was entering a fairly rough area, and his job was, according to Titus chapter 1, verse 5, set things in order and appoint elders in every city. So how do you set things in order? Well, a general outline, chapter 1, you set things in order within the church. You've got to make sure that the Lord's church is the Lord's church. Chapter 2 Work on the homes. Make sure that fathers and mothers, make sure that young men, young women, know what their role and responsibility is. Number three, 
set the example in order. How does this church contact the community? And what does the congregation look like in relation to the people who are not a part of the church, but they've heard of the church? And so when you set these three things in order, then God's church is what it needs to be. Well, here we are, 21 centuries later. And as you look at us, at our local congregation, the question is, are we in order? And what is it we need to do to be sure that we are set in order? Well, Paul starts off by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talking to Titus, and he says, hey, if you want to make sure your congregation is going in the right direction, look at the eldership. Look at the leaders. And so he begins telling them about the qualifications of being an elder. What it is that they must do. They must be the husband of one wife. And you go through and see that they must have faithful children. And you see, these, uh, you see these qualifications that come through. And so we ask ourselves, as we think about that, if you're not familiar with the church, what is an elder? Well, let's take a step back and talk about that for a second as we're talking about putting the church in order. Philippians 1.1 tells you the roles and responsibilities that happen in a church. Philippians 1.1 is written to the elders, to the deacons, and to the saints. And so you see the elders have an obligation to oversee the church. Deacons have an obligation to, as the word dekonoi says, to serve. And saints cover every single member of the Lord's church. Now, some religious groups hold saints as special people to whom you pray, people who have passed on, who have had a miracle performed after they've passed on or during their life, and who have been voted into that position. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that everyone who is covered in the blood of Christ, everyone who becomes a Christian, is a saint. And so this week, as you get ready for Christmas... And if you're worried about whether Santa Claus is coming to see you or not, remind him that you're a saint. Maybe that'll work, but it may be too late. Who knows? So what are we talking about when we talk about elders? You see their qualifications or you see their names in Acts chapter 20 and 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll cover this very quickly because I think we cover this pretty often. They have three positions to their office. Elders is what they're usually called in the New Testament. That's why we usually call them elders. And that's talking about the maturity. They are people who have been Christians. They're not novices. They've been Christians for a long time, and especially it's good if they've been Christians in that congregation for a long time. They know who the people are. They have experienced life, and they know how to teach other people, and they have gained the respect of the congregation for them. The second title, sometimes given, as you look in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5, and also Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, is they are managers. That's not always the word we use. Sometimes we call them presbyters. Sometimes we call them bishops. But all those words actually mean people who are good at managing. Not managing money, not managing things, but managing souls. They know how to organize a congregation. They know how to put people in places of leadership and put people in places of service. They're good at making sure that God's church is able to do well. And the third title, and perhaps our favorite title, is the title poimen, which is translated pastors, which is better translated shepherds. Lynn Anderson wrote a book many decades ago. I don't exactly agree with the end of that book, but I like the title. And that book is A Smell Like Sheep. And what he means by that title is a shepherd, if he were to walk into a store, you wouldn't want to be around him because he smells like sheep because he's around the livestock so often. Well, elders need to be among the flock. They have a responsibility to know the flock, to make sure the flock is fed, to make sure the flock is protected, to make sure the flock is doing well. And so as you read through uh, Titus chapter 1, you begin to see that role that they have. Well, why is it that it's important to set elders and deacons and saints well within the church? 
Because look there in chapter 1 and verse 13. We see in chapter 1 and verse 13 that we have a responsibility to keep the church sound in the faith. Now, the singing tonight sounded absolutely wonderful. And we're very good at singing. And as a matter of fact, when people who are not members of the Lord's Church come and visit, they're always amazed that we have a choir of 300 people. Well, that's not what this verse is talking about. It's a nautical term when we talk about someone who's sound. It talks about how someone is able to withstand the rigors of traveling across a lake or an ocean. There are some congregations which are taking on water. There are some congregations that perhaps have already sunk. And Timothy is to put together a church which can float and do well, which can accomplish the purpose which God has for it. That's why the church needs to be sound. What is it that sinks a ship? It's not the water that's outside. It's the water that gets inside that sinks the ship. What's the problem with Crete and the church which is in Crete? Perhaps it's not the problem with the people who are inside, but what if the people outside come within the church and they're not changed? Notice how Paul describes these people. He says they're full of liars, they're evil and selfish beasts, and they're lazy gluttons. Titus, make sure the church is not full of people of lies, who will say whatever it takes to make people happy, who will say whatever it takes, whether it's in the Bible or not, to do whatever they want. Make sure that they're not selfish. I have a puppy dog at home. Uh, sometimes I wonder what in the world I was thinking, but usually I love that little thing. We have always had small dogs. And this dog's a German Shepherd. And every once in a while I wonder what in the world am I doing? When that German Shepherd is around the house and you're not paying attention, he likes to grab stuff and do stuff and chew stuff. You know, there's some, I wouldn't say he's an evil beast, but there's some people who are that exact same way. They're always looking for an opportunity to take an advantage. They're not very disciplined. They don't know when to sit. They don't know when to stay. They're going to do whatever they feel is right. And they're going to live in any way that they want to. And they're going to be upset that if they're ever judged or ever rebuked, they're going to get angry. The church has to be sound and secure against those kind of people. Lazy gluttons. Do we have people in the church who are not willing to serve, who just want to sit on the pew, who just want to feed off the word or feed off the activities or feed off whatever they can get out of the church without giving anything back? If so, we've not taught enough about service. If so, we've not talked enough about how each one of us as Christians should give to other people. And so Titus is told, as far as the church is, Build a sound church. Create a congregation that does not look like the world as far as its morality and as far as its following after doctrine. Notice if you go down to verse 14. In verse 14, don't give heed to these false doctrines, these Jewish fables and commandments of men. And then he begins describing the issue. To the pure, all things are pure. To those with a dirty mind, whatever is said is taken in a perverted and an unpure way. Create a congregation, Titus, with people who see what's best in every situation. Titus, create a congregation where there, there's not gossip and people aren't always looking for what's worse than everybody. But instead, people are pure-minded. They're not jealous of one another, but they're looking to help one another to do better, to be better, and to grow into what God would have us to be. Now let's look at the second chapter. Once the church is right, Titus, once you've created a sound congregation, now, Titus, I want you to focus on the people within that church. We live in a very, very interesting There are people who teach that gender 
is just a social construct. That there's no such thing as being a man and there's no such thing as being a woman. We live in a very interesting culture where everybody, whether they are 90, whether they are 40, they wish that they were 20. There's no respect for gray hair or lack of hair. There's no respect for the roles of men and of women. But as Paul tells Titus, to establish a church and set things in order, he wants to speak to the older men and the older women. He wants to speak to the younger men and the younger women as well. Notice what he says. Older men, be sober. That's not speaking of alcohol. That's talking about being alert and realizing the way the world truly works. Older men, recognize the way the world is. Older men, be reverent. Put God in His place and realize that God is in control. Older men, be sound in the faith. Know what you believe and why you believe it. And be able to teach your kids, be able to lead your home for God. Older men, do these things not in a cruel way, but with love. Love your wives. Love your children. Love and respect those who are with you. Older men, be patient. Not everything is going to work in your time. And not everybody is going to do what you say. But be loving and be patient with everyone who's around you. Then Paul looks over. And by the wisdom of the Spirit, he does not call them old women. He calls them older women. You get in trouble if you call people old women, don't you? The older ladies, he says, be reverent. Show respect to God and follow God in everything that you do. Older ladies, don't be people who are slandering. Talking about what everybody else is wearing. Talking about what everybody else is doing talking about what everybody else has going on in their family or at work or in their life, but be a person who looks for what's best in other people. Be a person who builds other people up. Don't be a gossiper, but rather be discreet. Recognize the importance and the joy of keeping private things private. Be chaste. Be homemakers. Be a person who creates a home place that is pleasant and joyful to be in. Be good and be obedient to your husbands. Then Paul instructs Titus to look at the younger ladies who are growing up. And he says, older ladies, teach the younger ladies to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, usually we think that sort of thing comes naturally, doesn't it? And usually we think, well, that's a silly command, because doesn't everybody who's married love their spouse? And don't you always love your children? Sometimes we need encouragement, and sometimes we need help to learn to love, and to learn exactly what love looks like in the situation in which we are. Younger men, those men who are growing up, once again, like the older men, they are to be sober-minded. Realize the world that you're growing up in. Realize the choices and decisions that you make have consequences. And you live with those consequences and those choices that you make. Set in your life a pattern of good works. It's easy to be good for a day. It's easy to be good for a week. It's a little bit harder to be good for a month. And it's even harder to be good for a year. But your reputation and your character are not made in a day. Have a pattern of good works. 
So that when people see your life, they see the way in which you are. Young men, know what you believe. Have integrity in your doctrine. So many of our younger generation don't know the Bible. And they don't know why we live in a way in which we live. And so often there's trouble among our young folks because they've not been taught Scripture well. Paul tells Titus, focus on these young folks and make sure their pattern and make sure that their integrity is there. Young people, be reverent. Put God in God's place. Watch who you're around because you need to be incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 15, reminds us that evil companionship corrupts good morals. The friends you choose, the people that you're around will determine the kind of person that you become. And maybe most difficult, watch the things that you say. Watch your speech. And so as you and I look at that, and we see the older men and the older ladies, and we see the younger men and the younger ladies, we see how the home should be set up. And there's a lot of rules that come through there. There's a lot of checklists, if you will, as you come through there. But Paul says, I want you to recognize, Titus, as you're teaching these folks, that while the checklists are important, that's not everything that's there. And so Paul recites what some people think is a church song, and maybe it is, and maybe it's not. But he talks about a beautiful word, grace. Look there in chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. As you and I look at that, we see that we live in a way in which we're always looking toward the appearing of our Lord, Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, as we make the church be organized the way it should, and as we make the family organized in a way that we should, then we ask ourselves, what is it that we do? How is it that this should operate? How is it that we touch and contact the world? First thing is to show respect to the world. That sounds strange, doesn't it? And you don't hear that very often. But Christians are to be respectful. Paul says, be subject to your rulers, obey them, and be ready for every good work. The best citizen in the entire country should be Christians. And the best people... And your entire school should be Christians. The leaders of the banks, the leaders of the schools, the leaders of the factories, the leaders of everything should be Christians. Not because we're smarter, not because we're better, but because we show respect. We honor our culture. We honor the people of our culture. And we live as good citizens. Notice what Paul says. Christians, don't speak evil of anyone. Be sure that you're a person who is peaceable, not always looking for a fight, who is humble, not always putting yourself first, and who is gentle, gentle in helping other people. Does that describe us? When you look at yourself in the relation of your school place or your workplace, when you look at yourself in the way in which you live, are you peaceable, gentle, and humble? Do you find yourself speaking evil of other folks all the time? When people think of a conversation they've had of you, are you busy talking about what everybody has done wrong? Or are you a person who's always building other people up? There are too many people in this world who tear down. There are too many people in this world who are negative about everything that there is in the world. 
Christians are called to be different. Paul says, in your relationship with the world, remember that you once were a sinner, but now God has saved you. Now that's good for personal history, but why does Paul put that here in this third chapter in talking about a relationship to the world? When somebody mistreats you, remember that you once were a person of the world who mistreated other people. When somebody hurts you, when somebody is living in a way that they should not live, remember the same grace that saves you also saves them. Remember the same blood that brought you into Christ is also available to them. Remember that they too are created in the image of God. I love verse 9. Verse 9 says, avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, strivings about the law. Avoid these things because they're unprofitable. How often do we get in arguments about things which really don't matter? This world needs to see Christians as people who unify, as people who love, and as people who help. Now let's look in verse 14. Let our people maintain good works. Let our people meet urgent needs. And let our people be sure that they are not unfruitful. When you look at this pattern, which is here, and when you see where Paul is telling Titus how to put a church together and how you and I are called to be a congregation of the Lord's church in our community, how do you measure up? Well, we have good, good, good eldership here. And we're able to be sound. We're able to stand against false doctrine and those things which are out there. But could we do better? Could we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? When you and I look at our families, are we doing the things which the older men and older women are instructed to do? Are we being reverent? Are we being loving? Are we teaching that next generation who's coming up what it means to be a man in Christ and what it means to be a lady who is a Christian? When we look at our relationship with the world and you see how people in the world view us, are we a people who like to fight and are known for our useless wranglings? Or are we peaceable and gentle and helping other people to grow? Are we a people who instead of gossiping and instead of slander, help people by encouraging and lifting folks Titus chapter 1 talks about setting things in order. 